Thank you very much, and thank you to the Yashoda Center for really organizing an amazing meeting up here. And uh, really what I'm going to share with you this uh, session is what Olympus tools are out there uh, which kind of enhance some of the procedures that we're doing. This is not really an Olympus view, this is really my view of what the tools that they have and some of the systems that they have in place um, at the moment. And unlike our previous speaker, I'm not going to show you any of the future tech because there is quite a lot that's coming up, uh, but uh, that really has to clear the regulatory process before I share it. So these are my conflict of interest disclosures and like quite a lot of people in this front row, it's very overloaded and maybe we should shed some of these and just make it make our biggest conflict to look after our patients. So Olympus have introduced this new EVIS X1 system. It's been out in Europe for the last 18 months. And what I thought I'd do is just share some of the advantages of this system compared to the previous systems. Now, initially when me and Felix Hirth went to Tokyo and had a look at this system, we said, well, why do we need it? We've got phenomenal images with our current bronchoscopy system. These are just toys, but what I'll try and do is put it all into context. Um, the three systems that are relevant is this. This is automatic brightness adjustment with maintenance of contrast. This is a red um, eye, and this is texture enhancement. And I'll just go through the relevant roles in a moment. So what really I wanted to focus on is how does this influence our current practice? And I don't know what the state is in uh, Asia and India at the moment, but in the Europe and in the US, I think there's a transition from doing diagnostic procedures to more and more therapeutic procedures. We, there's been a change in the natural history of lung cancer, for instance. We hardly see any central tumors. 10 years ago, I used to see lots of squamous cell carcinomas in the trachea, main bronchi. I think I see one every once a year nowadays compared to hundreds of patients. <clears throat> so the first one I wanted to talk about is this brightness adjustment imaging with maintenance of contrast. And what do we mean by this? It's really, if you look at the uh, image that you get at bronchoscopy, the segmental bronchi are not very obvious, and it'd be a great advantage if we can see much deeper into the airway, and this allows us to shorten our procedure. So if you look at the two images now, the initial image, you can see, you can't really see the subsegmental airways, but with this mode, the brightness adjustment imaging with maintenance of contrast, you can see the segmental anatomy quite clearly. So if you're doing a therapeutic procedure, where you're trying to insert, let's say, an illumicide catheter into a particular subsegment, and you're using a therapeutic scope, so you can't quite go deep enough, this technology helps us to insert more accurately into the relevant subsegment in comparison to the normal standard bronchoscopic mode. Also, it kind of speeds up your procedure, even if you're doing a, a simple diagnostic procedure, you're more rapidly able to inspect all the airways down to the subsegments in comparison to the normal uh, mode. So actually these days, the brightness adjustment imaging with maintenance of contrast, the BMAC eye mode, is almost permanently on, on our system. So just to reinforce, um, you know, you can tailor with this system exactly what modalities you want on, what modalities you want off, and in, in my system, this is probably permanently on these days because uh, I'm a lazy bronchoscopist. Less is more, I always say. Uh, here's just an example of it, and you'll see the uh, video roll. Um, so this is with it on, and just roll that again. So yeah, you've got textured enhancement mode. Now again, this is a very subtle, uh, I think my battery is running low as well as the computer's battery. Perhaps you can adjust that for me. So anyway, what I'm trying to show up here is you can see the cartilaginous structures on that, um, on the, on the left-hand image, and on the right-hand image, it is super enhanced. Again, very subtle improvement in the technology, and uh, there are some modes where this is more useful. 
So again, when you're a more junior bronchoscopist learning at the learning stage, it kind of enhances the cartilaginous structures just to give you a more three-dimensional image compared to the two-dimensional image you get with this uh, a mode off. So here's an example where you saw the video where it, you kind of put it on and it just becomes more um, significant. It'd be great if you could run the video again just to highlight that. Not possible with this single monitor controller. So here's another mode, and this is basically red dichromatic imaging. So it, it uses a, a facility to try and get rid of some of the light and concentrate on one or two areas. And the advantage of it is it shows you some of the deeper blood vessels. So if you're doing a procedure like uh, airway bypass or cross country, where you're making a hole through the airway to go into deeper alveolar structures, clearly you would want to avoid this area. So this just gives you an extra bit of comfort to know exactly where you can do uh, procedures without any um, difficulty. So there's the white light image. You can't really see this vessel clearly. You wouldn't really know it existed there. But on this mode, it kind of helps. Also, if you've got a bleeding source, it, try, it tries to make it a little bit easier to manage. So here's an example. You can see that it was completely red. But now you can see the focus of bleeding is just there. So if you were going to go in with argon plasma, for example, you could actually cauterize the more accurate area of the airway rather than the whole of that airway. You know, you'd be tempted to circumferentially spray your argon plasma, whereas with the mode on, you know exactly which area to cauterize, and that may help you control bleeding more quickly, but also reduce the kind of scarring that you might create by treating the whole of that airway surface. It's a very, very simple, small adjustments to the imaging system, but you can see that they probably have some role in interventional practice, and it just takes you to that little edge further um, in your practice. Here's another example of all of these put together, and we're all used to this, which is the narrow band imaging, where you enhance the capillary loops. Again, I think this is more value for ENT surgeons and in endoscopy, where you're looking at Barrett's esophagus. With the transition of our tumors onto more peripheral lesions, we're less likely to see this in the Western world. But I think in, I'm not quite sure I'd be interested to discuss this with some of my colleagues in India, whether they're still seeing more and more central tumors in the airway. And, and this was just to summarize how you can use the different textural modes to enhance the 3D appearance of the uh, bronchoscopic images. Now I'm just going to focus on some of the bronchoscopes that they've introduced in, in uh, context with this uh, imaging system. The first one is really the EVIS-1 um, high-definition scope. The distal tip's about 4.9 millimeters, and therefore it's increased the instrument channel to 2.2. It's also got a rotation function, and Olympus has actually been a class leader in all of this and had the rotation function for the last series, which is about five years old, and they've carried it on to the new systems as well. And what is the advantage of this scope? Well, the main advantages of it is that you can go quite peripheral uh, with this. Plus, you can see with the larger, um, with all the different bronchoscopes they've got, they've increased the suction ca ca capability by about 20%. So the interventional scope used to be 2.8 millimeters. The channel size is now 3 millimeters. The other uh, workhorse scope was 2 millimeters and is now 2.2 millimeters. So roughly a 20% increase in suction capability. And here's a, a valve procedure that we're doing. And with the valves, we like to place the um, position on the carina more accurately. Here you can see the image is absolutely awful. I wouldn't want to just fire that valve in, uh, which is very tempting. So with added suction and a bit of patience, you just see life becomes a lot more clearer. And once you've got a clear image of your distal carina, you can then more accurately place your endobronchial valve onto the carina. So this is just in that segmental airway, just being very patient, using suctioning. And there you see 
you've got a much more clear image of the carina, and then you can get much more accurate placement of your endobronchial valve, rather than if you just uh, shot the valve into that very dark, um, bloody airway. So some improvements and implications with therapeutic bronchoscopy. So the next um, technique is really looking at um, <clears throat> basically using the rotation function to kind of manipulate the scope more easily. Because you remember, the Olympus system throws the instruments out at 3 o'clock. And sometimes it's not possible to accurately see, again, your carina. So here's another endobronchial valve placement in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe. And you're not really getting an adequate vision into this area. But by rotating the rotating function, you can actually see the airway more clearly and once again have more precision placement of your endobronchial valves. I mean, this is probably the most crucial use of uh, that rotation function technique. And it just allows you to get ergonomically uh, improve uh, how you position the bronchoscope um, and place the valves. Instead of the old days where you might be doing various yoga positions to get the same kind of um, imaging and access. So that's really based on the rotation function that I've just described, really much more easier um, access to various areas. Um, that just outlines how much of this moves. It moves 120 degrees on both sides, but yet maintains quite marked flexibility. And this just pictorially shows how your tool quite dramatically moves as you use the rotation function. But one piece of advice is remember, once you've rotated your scope, it's very important when you're doing the next bit of the procedure to centralize again. Otherwise, you will remain offset and might be uh, utilizing the scope inappropriately. This is just an example with uh, bronchial rheoplasty. Again, uh, just allowing you to get better access into a segmental area because it's really important to go directly in line uh, and not bend the catheter. And yet again, use the rotation function just to give you a little bit more access um, into that segmental airway so you can feed the rheoplasty catheter, open up the basket under vision, and then uh, um, apply your pulsed electrical field energy. So although these functional uses may seem very subtle, these small Im improvements that they made to their system really improves uh, the simplicity of performing your interventional procedures. So it just allows us to get more direct access into these different airways. So basically, just to summarize those aspects, um, you can use the new interventional scopes, whether it's the large scope or the very thin scope, which you use for your cryospray, um, and really try and maintain uh, coaxial intubation into the subsegmental airways with more ease than you would do with the previous systems. The brightness adjustment mechanism allows you to go much deeper and also allows more precision uh, placement of various tools into the subsegmental airways. And the XI clinical benefits also is the more amazing uh, suction ability as well as the imaging. So they're all very subtle changes, but can significantly enhance your utility. And then there's the very ultra-thin bronchoscope. And you can see that compared to the conventional scope, there's a lot more flexibility. So this is a little bit like the adverts uh, of the Carlsberg beer that used to go around in Europe, that this uh, instrument can go deeper than most other instruments. Finally, I wanted to just finish, because obviously uh, Olympus have now acquired Varan Technologies, and the biggest topic nowadays is peripheral bronchoscopy and access into pulmonary nodules. And with the new Varan system, you can obviously do a virtual bronchoscopy to first map your pathway to the target, and then uh, you can then use the system to guide you and the tools. All of the tools are also tracked, so you can see tool in lesion with these virtual systems. And this is just 
uh, Olympus video to show you uh, how this kind of process works. So you do an inspiratory and an expiratory CT scan with the patient's hands above the head and also with the markers on the chest on both sides. The inspiratory and expiratory uh, CT allows the system to then calibrate when you're performing the patient. So one of the biggest problems that we've seen with all of the virtual bronchoscopic platforms with uh, accessing the periphery is this respiratory motion and this variant system allows that gating of that motion and, and they claim slightly more accurate uh, access to the target. But as we've all learned, even with these kind of technologies, you do need real-time imaging with the combination of radial ultrasound and also cone beam CT scan to really uh, localize where you are. And that just really summarizes all the kind of different differences between that and the current existing platforms. And I will stop there. Thank you very much.